Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I pray everyone is well and uh, had a wonderful uh, past week. Or as I would say, it's been a God week. Um, we're about ready to begin our studies. Um, I, um, I've sent out the uh, remainder of the lesson. And um, it is also available on this link at the top. If you click on um, the Google Drive note, you can download it. Uh, if, you, if you can't get it from there, just shoot me an inbox and I will email it to you or um, email me or whatever. All right, let us begin with prayer. God in heaven, we praise and we bless you now um, for this day. We give you glory for we know that you alone are worthy. We pray now, Lord, that as we begin um, this second lesson in coming out of the darkness, that you will send your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us to uh, give us an understanding and to empower us um, to be able to make the bold steps we need in order to break free of those things that um, hold us in darkness and prevent us from walking in the light. We bless you now and give you praise. In the glorious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Kisman, how are you? Um, I pray that everyone um, is doing well again for those that are just joining. Um, record. Pardon me? Record. Oh, yes. Thank you. So that's why you're on this call. This conference is being recorded. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad somebody knows to remind me to do what I'm supposed to do. All right, so um, let us um, get started. Um, last week, um, we concluded uh, lesson one, uh, which um, in our coming out of darkness was basically um, got us started, and it was about basically about leaving the comfort zone. Uh, today's lesson uh, is titled The Breaking Point. Um, when we think about breaking point, um, the, the thing that I want to first note is that everything has a breaking point. Everything, every person. Uh, just as water has a boiling point or a freezing point, um, there is a breaking point. Uh, in, our, in our study of the life of Jacob, um, we, we come to a critical turning point in his life. Uh, prior, to this, um, prior to this encounter, or, or to this passage, Jacob has basically been able to maneuver his entire life, right? He's basically lived up to his name. Um, his name means um, heel grabber. Uh, he was named heel grabber uh, because when he was born, he came out holding on to his brother's heel. Uh, some have argued that he was trying to pull Esau back in so that he could come out first. Uh, but he um, he comes out as a heel grabber. Uh, it is also uh, translated um, to say one is a heel grabber, to also say that they are trickster, deceiver, manipulator, and so forth. And so basically, uh, if you did any um, in-depth study, and as we've talked, you've discovered that Jacob has pretty much lived up to that name, uh, being able to um, do what needs to do in order to get what he wants and to um, make his life as um, beneficial and um and and basically to create uh, what he believed to be uh his birthright right and so he, he's basically just been taking care of business doing what he believed was his god-given using his gifts to his ability uh to his god-given abilities um but but the the other side to that is that when we get to our selected pericopes for tonight which is uh genesis um 32 verses 21 through 25, um, he has come to a point where all of his skills are, are not working out for him. <laughs> uh, he, he's, he's basically uh, tried uh, conniving. He's, he, he's tried to um, bribe his brother into uh, not being mad with him. And, um, and so uh, let me, for the, uh, the sake of study, in case some of you have not been keeping up and have not been um, uh, maintaining a uh, reading of Genesis 32, just to give you, uh, just to read that passage. 
So verse 21 picks up like this. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, which is also concubines, with his, his other two women, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip, hip was wrenched, and he wrestled as he wrestled with the man. All right, so I know, uh, uh, let me just say for disclaimer, I know um, if you've been around church any length of time, you've heard the story of Jacob wrestling with an angel. Um, and you've heard it over and over again. I hear you, Dolores. Amen. So hopefully this uh, this study, if you're at your breaking point, hopefully tonight's study will be able to help you to be able to navigate uh, that. So, but if you've heard this story over and over again, and I know uh, I can remember countless times hearing it and hearing preachers preach about it. And when they get to that point about Jacob wrestling with the angel and, and all of that, it, it becomes a celebratory moment, right? Um, um, and, and that's really next, 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 uh, the next lesson that deals with where they get, get excited about. He's saying, I won't let you go till you bless me. But, but before you get that, you have to look at all the um, nuances that happen before he even gets to the angel. The text reveals to us like this. Uh, Jacob has great possessions, right? He has all of these, um, he's accumulated all of this wealth. Uh, basically by um, uh, manipulating, tricking his uncle, uh, he was able to just gain all of this enormous wealth. And then, um, and he has these children. So he's been away from home at least 20 years. Um, when he first left home running from Esau, um, he has um, what, what, we what is known as a theophany. Um, and and you, you know, I give you all these, these words, right? That, you know, to help you understand. So a theophany is a Greek word, uh, which means um, uh, the appearance of God, a visible appearance of God in the Old Testament. Uh, Jacob has uh, basically three uh, encounters with God. The first one in Genesis 28, when he first leaves, um, when he first leaves um, his father's house on his way to Laban's house, and he's basically by himself, and um, he. Um, God appears. He sees this manifestation of God and he sees this ladder coming from heaven. And basically God speaks to him and says to him, I'm the God of your grandfather, the God of your father, and I'll be your God. And, and that your, your seed will number, uh, be more numerous than the stars, more plenteous than the sand. And so he gives Jacob this great promise of a great future and tells him he's going to be with him. And so Jacob is encouraged. He goes on uh, to Laban's house and he does um, he basically begins to walk in what he considers uh, his birthright and authority in which God has given him. Uh, at, at the point in which it's time to leave, um, you know, there's a big rift that's happened between him and Laban. You know, Laban, he finally decides, you know, it's time for him to go. He takes his, his uh, children away, his wife and his kids, and they leave. We talked about that last week, how Laban pursued him, wanted to kill him, but God would not let him. So at this point now, Jacob knows he has to go home. He has to go and face what he has left behind. And in doing so, that means that he also must face his brother. He must face Esau. And as we, we've talked in the previous two lessons, he sends all these possessions over. Um, but at the same token, he's told that Esau is still coming after him. And so after he sent, he sends all his gifts ahead. He then sends his children and wives ahead. The text says, that they cross over the ford of Jabbok, J-A-B-B, okay, Jab Jabbok is a river. Uh, I, I think the most interesting thing I found, one of the interesting things I found in this text is, is how um, the words, uh, the various um, imagery comes forward. Jabbok, uh, the Hebrew word uh, Jabbok means the place of emptying. It is literally uh, a river uh, wherein all the other rivers just dump all of their residue in. It, it, it's the place where um, everything is emptied out. And it's, it's, it's ironic, I think, um, that Jacob would find himself in that place where he actually gets to a point where he has to empty out. He has to discard 
everything that has been who he was, everything that made him have the appearance of being a great man and now come to the place where where he is he's he's basically um bare naked it's almost synonymous with um the issue with um adam when god comes in the eve in the in the the eve of the day and says adam what you know where are you and adam says i didn't come forward because i was naked jacob finds himself in this barren state where um, he is totally exposed. Everything about him uh, is up for grabs. It's, it's questionable. And, and what I want to posit today is that at, every, at, at any given point, all of us have those moments when we come to those breaking points, when, when things just seem to uh, come to a head. Uh, we come to moments that change our, the course of life forever. It, it's amazing uh, to me how suddenly things can change, you know. Uh, You go to bed and you wake up and your whole life has been transformed. The phone rings and someone says, I've got bad news. Uh, You fail the exam. Test came back positive. Child dies. Uh, You know, you're fired. Um, So many different things that can happen at any given moment. And, you know, um, you know, you have a disease. Uh, You're getting divorced. All these things. There's a, a breaking point where you either shatter internally externally or corporately in your faith. Uh, it, it, it all depends on how you manage and how you handle these. It's not a question on if you'll have a breaking point. The question is, how do you handle it? What, how, do you, how do you manage and how do you move forward after it? Uh, um, a lot of times when we get to those breaking points, uh, we tend to become immobilized. Immobilized in the sense that we don't know what to do. We didn't expect it to happen. It's out of the blue. And we always seem to ask the question, where is God? How did God allow this to happen? And you always get some good churchy folk that will come and tell you, the Lord won't put no more on you than you can bear. And I promise you, when you at that point, that's the last thing you want to (laughs) hear. Or or, or to tell people, you know, people say, well, just just pray about it. And, you know, you're going to get through it. Everything's going to be all right. No, it don't feel like everything's going to be, you know, I know that sounds all well and good. And I always tell people, you know, sometimes when you don't know what to say, shut your mouth. Just don't say nothing. Um, If if you can't change the situation, just be present with the person in it. Um, But but because it's at those moments when you're just scraping, trying to figure out um, where do I go next? particularly when everything that you've trusted, everything that you believe, everything that you've hoped for seems to be just going up in smoke. And so uh, there are those who who hold everything internally and and don't talk about it and try to paint on a happy face and people ask, oh, I'm fine, I'm blessed and highly favored, you know, everything's all right, God's got me. But internally, you don't even believe that, you know? You're you're about to lose your mind, about to just, just fall totally apart. To the point that if somebody said the wrong thing, you just like just burst out in tears or just totally crack up, right? Or externally, when you just go off on folks, you're mad with everybody, mad with your family, mad with the world, um, you, you got road rage, uh, you're just mad with everything. Or it becomes corporately where you're mad with the institutions that you believe have caused that. You know, th- this is what happens when people uh, become, uh, you know, when someone goes to the post office and want to shoot up everybody or they come on their job, they just, you know, they want to take out everything that's associated with what I believe has pushed me to this breaking point. Um, but the truth is the common denominator in all of those situations is you. Uh, we're the ones, you know, I have to deal with me every day more so than I have to deal with, with anybody else or any systems, Right. And so really the person that I have to focus on is how, who am I, regardless of what the situation, if it's raining inside, who, outside, who am I? If, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if the sun is shining, if when things are well, who am I? Who am I when things go bad? And when you begin to check that person and begin to prioritize, you know, what is important to you, what matters most, and, and those things that strengthen you as opposed to cause you to be uh, weak, uh, and I say weak in, in the faith in, in the sense because um, weakness is not necessarily negative when, it, when it's in regard to you're weak in the sense that you're trusting God. So there is a breaking point that requires, well, it is at these breaking points that requires you to develop 
um, a new uh, way of doing things, new organizational structure, new realignment of ideas. Um, you have to become creative. Your your mindset changes. The way you used to think about stuff, it, you're like, you know what? That don't even apply anymore. Um, I was talking to a colleague uh, one day that um, really, uh, you know, he, he, he's a very good preacher, pastor, and uh, but really had an issue dealing with people, uh, dealing with homosexuals, right? Um, he he uh, he always viewed homosexuality as one of the greatest sins that anybody could uh, commit, right? And so he would, um, uh, if they came around his church or if he saw him, he was just so condemning. He was, you know, didn't want him around him, didn't didn't want anything to do with anybody who had anything to do with homosexual. Until he got into a CPE class, uh, and CPE, for those who may not know, is clinical pastoral education. And it's designed to help you be able to navigate difficult situations and to lead other people through it, uh, such as grief, um, emotional struggles, family strains, whatever the case is. Uh, as a pastor, we are expected, and ministers particularly, we are expected to be able to help folk in every situation. Uh, the problem is that while you may hold that role, if you're not equipped to do it, you need to navigate to somebody else, direct them to somebody else if you don't have a skill set to do it. It does not come just because you know a scripture to quote and just because um, you, you know how to preach or whatever and maybe even be a good prayer. If you're not equipped to deal with grief counseling, don't try to do it because you sometimes cause more damage than good. And so we, so, um, so anyway, so he gets in the CPE class and in, in the class, they're put in groups. And so during the whole duration of the class, they deal only with their group. It's about six people in a group, um, male and female. There's this one female in the group who's real cool, and they really bond over the course of the year, and they really become like family, and they're loving each other. And it's not until the end of the course that the um, the instructor begins to unveil uh, certain things about each member in each group. And when he finds out the young lady in his group is a lesbian, it just he said it just transformed everything about him. He was like. Yeah, because he always thought les, you know, homosexuals were just the worst sinners and they were vile and evil and there was no good in them. But this person was loving and caring and she loved God and 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 she cared about folk and, and she was, you know, just just filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, just a really great person. But it was at the end of the class he finds out she's a lesbian. And he was like, wait a minute. So he's, he, you know, when he was telling me, he said, just changed his whole thought pattern that we can't go around making delineations about who a person is or what they are just because of one thing we know about them. Because uh, ultimately, we all got some kind of issue. And uh, some, you know, a lot of times we have a tendency because um, I don't do what you do, then what you do is worse than anything anybody can do. Um, and so he, he, he uh, it basically changed him. His whole mindset changed. It became a breaking point in his life and in his ministry and how he approached people that were different or were struggling with issues. And so how you handle a breaking point determines if you survive and thrive, right? Uh, there's a difference between surviving and thriving. You may get through the break breaking point, but you may find yourself still stuck. You may find yourself still... Um, lingering on the effects of it and still holding to that, that you don't thrive. You're just kind of a zombie going through the motion and still reeling from what has happened to you. Thriving means that I, I, I went through the darkness. I went through the, through hell, but, and, and because I've gone through it, I'm better for it and I'm, I'm better equipped and, and I'm ready for the next thing that comes. You cannot have a marriage that lasts 30 to 40 years unless it has a breaking point. There is not a relationship that you can put your finger on to say that it has been uh, successful and, and, and it's maturing if at some point it has not had some type of breaking point. The difference between people who get married three to four years and break up and those who last over 30 years is how you handle that breaking point. And here's the thing. If you don't learn how to master the breaking point, you may have many ventures, may have, you know, you may do a whole lot of good stuff, but you'll never have massive success. You'll you'll never be able to get uh, past that 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 threshold of, you know, I always get right here and I get knocked back down. It is it is because perhaps that this is your breaking point. Every time life pushes you to a breaking point, 
you, you'll, you'll find yourself always backing away and running or giving up or throwing up your hands and say, I knew I never amount anything. I ne never, nothing ever good comes. And you give up. Uh, you say stuff like it's too stressful, it's too emotional. You just don't go forward. But managing and, and surviving and thriving in the breaking point means that you recognize where this is, how it's feeling, and really being in touch with who you are and, what, and how you feel in that situation. Acknowledge it and then being determined to go forward. You cannot be a champion until you have survived a breaking point. And I'm, I'm quite sure on this phone and, um, and, and those who are listening online that there, there are a lot of y'all have been in or, and some have already identified that they are at those breaking points and really trying to figure out how to, um, how to move forward. Uh, here's one thing that I want you to, to write down in your notes. The first thing the enemy wants to do when you are at a breaking point is isolate you. The enemy wants you to get isolated. If he can ever get you by yourself, get you alone where you don't trust anybody, you ain't talking to nobody, you just close off. I don't want to deal with anything. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to take no bath. I, I remember one one lady uh, was at that church, and she this lady was testifying about how she had been depressed, and she said that you know I was so depressed that I didn't leave my house for two weeks. I ain't even take a bath. And I'm like, you know, it's some stuff you all not put in your testimony. <laughs> Two weeks, you ain't take a bath. But, uh, you know, it, it, but when you're at those moments, it just doesn't matter. She was celebrating the fact that, you know, she was, a, she, 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 she was able to come out of it. But the enemy's design is to isolate you. Because if he can isolate you, he can terminate you. Remember what Jesus says, that the, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can kill your joy, if he can steal your joy, kill your dreams, he will destroy your life. And so, and he does this by isolation, get you by yourself. You ain't going to church. You ain't, you don't want to be around your friends. You don't want to be around the family. You get off by yourself. And the moment he isolates you, then he begins to play with your head. I know I got a few witnesses where he starts playing with your head and making you think everybody's against you or don't nobody understand and can't nobody help you and this is the end and ain't nothing ever going to come out right and you might as well give up. Then you start thinking about suicide or you start thinking about homicide and, and you know, everything just gets just blown all out of proportion because that's what happens when you get in your own head. The more you isolate, the less chance you have of being fruitful. And if you're not fruitful, then you're in danger of God cutting you off, right? And, and let me say this, it is possible to be isolated and still show up at church. Y'all know that? It, it, it is still possible to be isolated and still go through the motions of going to church, still preaching in the pulpit, still singing in the choir, still doing all of your a normal routine, but you, you shut yourself off. You, you, you're, you're not open to, you don't want to hear anybody, you don't want to involve, and you isolate yourself from God. You ain't even want to talk to God. I ain't trying to hear that. You know, I'm just doing what I got to do and get out. Uh, uh, so, Tim, were you trying to say something? No, I was just saying that it's true because we can we can deceive ourselves into thinking we're okay. And a lot of times we can be going through, as you were stating, and, and we'll be like, I'm okay, I'm okay. But we're really not okay on the inside. And you can go through church, go through the motions and sit there. And be tore up mentally, physically, emotionally, just tore up. Yeah, exactly. And 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 do that in the process of encouraging other folk. You know, you've yeah, ever been in a true. place where you you can tell everybody else how good God is and what God's gonna do for them, but have no idea of God working on, on behalf of you, no vision of, of things turning around for you. You know, I'm just you know, and, and to the point that you think, you know what, my life is so awful, I've done so much. God ain't going to do nothing for me. But let me just pray for you. You know, if, if people knew where you were, they definitely would let you pray for them. Because I really don't want nobody praying for me if you can't believe God for yourself. Right. You know, that's like having somebody uh, keep your money and they can't keep up with theirs. You know, they lose all their money, but you can say, hey, I need you to keep all my money. Oh, no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> not going to do that. Um, so, so the first thing the enemy wants to do is isolate you. And, and, and it's interesting that when you're being traumatized, when you're interrogated psychologically, that you feel like you will never come out of it, that you feel like you, that you're about to lose your mind. It is interesting in those times when 
it seems like things begin to pile on. But the, 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 um, the blessing is, is that at those moments is when God has a way of sending a word. When you're at your breaking point, that God sends a word that lets you know that God has a plan and a strategy for your life. And that is exactly what happens in this text. You know, God sends Jacob a word to say all is not lost. Uh, I want you to notice something in this text. Uh, because because one uh, something peculiar particularly happens when we picked up our story uh, from from last week. Jacob was getting ready to encounter Esau, um, and you know as I said, he had sent everything away. And so so he after he he sent everything away, the text says that he's alone, right? Yeah. He, he, it is in this alone. He's at the place. I don't want y'all to miss this. He's at this place at the Jabbok, at the fork of the Jabbok River, which and that and that is the place of emptying, right? And at this place of emptying, he has emptied every emptied himself out, all of his resources out. And the text is clear in saying that he is alone. Uh, after he, look at 23, after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possession. That's the emptying. And and 24 says, so Jacob was left alone. Uh, it, it, it is that aloneness uh, sometimes that scares us. Um, I, I know folks that are always trying to be busy and doing stuff because they are afraid of being alone. Uh, they, they all, you know, keep themselves in relationships that are unhealthy because they're afraid of being alone. Uh, but the, 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 the irony is, is that it is in our aloneness that we are in a great place. Um, for God to uh, speak to us and to hear us. Um, it, 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 it has been said, well, that, uh, that a crisis um, is never made, um, that, that a crisis is never made by anyone. It only reveals, you know, the crisis. So when you're in a crisis, what it does, it reveals who you really are. Um, it, it reveals who you are. Uh, but it also reveals who God is in your crisis, in those in those breaking points. Because because before the crisis, you may look at life one way, and after the crisis, you see life in a whole nother way. And so when we come to these moments that that change the course of our life, um, it, it is at this point that we we have to either yield to the will of God, or uh, we find ourselves giving in and just totally losing. So the, the, the points that I want to make uh, before my time is up and I'm halfway done is, is that the first thing we have to recognize is that uh, breaking points are painful, right? Uh, don't let anybody tell you that they went through the storm and it was, you know, I just had joy. It was just, oh, praise the Lord. I just enjoyed the Lord through, uh, you know, as bad as it was. Um, you know, if they tell you that, you might want to go on and get them some psychological help. Cause uh, either either they in um, they 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 basically loony, or or they just good liars, you know. And and you know I know sometimes people say that because they don't want to own it or tell. But we you know we have to get to a point where we are transparent and honest with each other, because truth for the matter is what you're going through, somebody else has either already been through or they're getting ready to go through. And perhaps your testimony will help them. The word of God says that they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimonies, right? And so you, you may prevent somebody else from going through all the struggles you went through if you can share your struggles. It's painful. It hurts. It does not seem fair. But what it does, it, it reveals who you are. So what does the, the uh, Jacob's experience reveal about him? The first thing we reveal about him is, is Jacob's sense of independence exposes his insufficiency. He is used to being able to do what he needs to do to make stuff happen, right? Um, I'm sure he was able to, um, you know, pay for whatever he wanted, do whatever he wanted to do. And at this point, the text, if you remember in the previous verses, it talked about how afraid he was and fearful and stressful he was about, what it, about meeting Esau. And he was afraid Esau was going to kill him. And so sending over his wealth, his possessions, his family, uh, and offering them, he found out that that was enough, that, that his sense of independence um, was exposed, that, that he really couldn't take care of himself. He couldn't fix this situation. 
And it's painful to think that, you know, if you've been the one in your family who's fixed everything, took care of everybody to get to a place where now um, you can't fix, you can't take care of it. I distinctly recall uh, being in that situation, um, um, I think it was around two, 2001, 2000, let me see, 2003, when I got sick. Um, I had, you know, had been in ministry and, and, you know, the Lord had blessed me to minister to other folks, watch other people get healed and, and, and delivered. And then all of a sudden, you know, I become excessively, you know, very ill and to the point that, you know, doctors can't figure out what's going on. All I know is I'm getting sick and I'm on all these narcotics and I'm taking all this med and I'm basically a zombie. Uh, only, uh, only day I didn't take medication was on Sunday just so I could preach. And I came back and I was drugged up and I was not getting any better. Uh, to make matters worse, the medicine was causing more problems. So then I'm having organs shut down and this issue and this issue. And then I'm having heart trouble and, and all of this. And, and to the point that the doctors say, you know, if we continue, because in order to get me out of pain, uh, to get me out of pain, they were constantly increasing my medication. And every time the medication would increase, it was causing anything else. And I literally got to a point where I began to say, you know, and I was still, you know, praying for other folks and watching God heal them. And God wasn't doing nothing for me. To the point that I felt like, you know what, I might, what, what's the use of preaching? You know, this, I am, I can't do anything for myself. You know, I'm praying for everybody else and nothing happened to me. And so it's that exposure that puts you really at that breaking point where you have to now, you know, figure out, you know, how you're going to do it. And, and, and as I said earlier, I, I did all of that, you know, literally uh, dying internally and never told anybody. I, I didn't tell anybody how I was feeling. It was just my issue with me, right? So Jacob's independence is exposed, but secondly, his abundance produces objection. Uh, uh, abundance. He has all of this wealth. He has all these these animals, and he has these women and the children, and he just has you know he. Matter of fact, uh, early in the text, he says that uh, he he has um, he came in as one, and now he has two camps. You know, he has so much he had to split his people up. He basically it was two kingdoms right there among him, right? And so he has all these great possessions, and but what it has done is his possessions has put him, uh, has separated him from God. That that that, that objection means that that you left something important out. He 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 has surrounded himself, and and so often we can um, make ourselves believe that because I got people around me, because I got all these belongings, that prosperity gospel has done us the most disservice to make people think that because you're quote unquote blessed. You got money, you got a good job, house, all of that, 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 you know, you're blessed by God and God is with you. That doesn't mean God, because what happens oftentimes, uh, as Jesus says, that where your treasure is, that your heart may be. And if your treasure becomes so engulfed in maintaining stuff and getting stuff that you are not focused on your relationship with God, then you walk off and leave God behind. And Jacob had basically uh, received the blessing of God, but for God to honor the God who gave the blessing. You, you, you celebrate the blessing, but you forget the one who gave the blessing. And it, and it's in doing that, that, that we find ourselves even more at a breaking point where you have to make a cheese. You, uh, hi, Angela, how are you? Um, you? You have to make a choice about where you go from here. And so it's painful. It's painful to recognize that you can't fix stuff, you're on your own. And it's painful also when you come face to face with yourself and recognize, hold up, I got all this stuff. But I don't have God, and and it, it and it's even more traumatizing to do it in in the in in front of everybody else. When you're on a stage, when you're the pastor, when when you're the one that everybody is looking to, and 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 people are already saying all these great things, and they think you got it all together, and you know you really know how you you know your life is just perfect, and you know the truth. I oh, mean that that's enough there to make you lose it all on its own. Uh, and so that's what Jacob is. He he's the one that's supposed to make it right, and you know he he was able to get the blood, the birthright. He was able to trick uh, Laban out of all the best uh, 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 sheep and you know all the all the best animals. He 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 weathered the storm. He got he got Leah and uh, Rebe Rachel, and so he got, he has um he has all of this stuff, and he's able to do it. But now he recognizes I don't have God, the God who met me at Bethel. I somehow wandered off without him. And, and so at, at the next stage, uh, you, what you find in the text is that um, 
he's at this place, the place of emptying. He is alone. And it's, it's in this aloneness, the text read like this, that, that, that Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched and he wrestled with the man. Now, I don't know if you all saw the sermon when I preached this a few, uh, last week, but uh, I'm going to just take you out there in case you did. Uh, this kind of becomes an English lesson. Uh, I hope you all remember English when, when it talks about nouns and pronouns. You all remember that? Everybody with me? <laughs> all right. Do I still have my folks on the line? Ain't nobody saying that. Did I hang up on y'all? Uh-oh, I think I hung up. Oh, I didn't hang up. Okay, y'all here. Okay, I thought I hung up. All right. So yeah, yeah, y'all understand. What it, so so a noun is something that takes is a noun names a person, place, a thing, right? Is that correct? My educators. Yeah. All right. And a pronoun takes the place of a noun. Am I right? Wow. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been in English. So I want to make sure I'm right. Everybody got time. So in in this text, there is uh, in verse 25 that we're looking at tonight. There is a series of pronouns in the text. Uh, I hope y'all got your Bibles open and not just looking in my face. Um, I want you to just, uh, if, if y'all don't mind writing in your Bible, you know, unless you use electronic or whatever, but make these notes. Uh, change the words like this in verse 25. Okay, so first of look, when the man, man is a pronoun, right? When the man saw that he, that's another pronoun, could not overpower him, another pronoun, he, that's a pronoun, touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his pronoun, hip was wrenched as he, that's a pronoun, wrestled with the man, another pronoun, okay? So now, allow me to change the pronouns into nouns so that we can actually see the text. When God, that's Saul, that Jacob, I'm sorry, when God saw that God could not overpower Jacob, God touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that Jacob's hip was wrenched as Jacob wrestled with God. Read it one more time. Make sure y'all get that. When God saw that God could not overpower Jacob. Can we just pause there for a minute? When God saw that God could not overpower Jacob. What what would hinder God from being able to overpower Jacob? I mean, God is omnipotent, right? There is there is nothing God cannot do. Isn't that what we always been told? Yeah. Y'all come on, talk to me. There's nothing that God cannot do, right? There's nothing too hard for God. But the writer in this text says that God saw that God could not overpower Jacob. So what happens? Why can't Je God overpower Jacob? What is it about Jacob? Or what is it about humanity or a person in general? What is it about us? What, what, what thing about us that God cannot overpower? Anybody? Himself. What about the himself? The God in us. The God in the us. The God that was in him. That's good. Okay. The God in him. Um, say more about that. God can't overpower the God in Jacob. Because God did declare that in greater work shall we do through him. And so did God he, declare who did God declare that or did Jesus declare that? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh yes, Lord. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus okay. So if you're saying because didn't God when he made when he made us, he declared that we had dominion. God said we had dominion over things he gave us to be, I guess, considered the gods of the earth and God. So isn't that in a sense that we have that same power as God? So in a sense he was wrestling against himself. Um, you own the right street, but okay. parked at the wrong address. Um me out. Okay. <laughs> You're on the right street. The Lord, uh, Nicole, you all are exactly right. Um, so, so what? Here, here's what's happening. Um, God gave in, in Genesis. He he tells gives humanity dominion over the animals and over the land, right? 
that dominion, which means we're supposed to rule. But that does not give us power over God. And so at, at, at no given time can we, you know, overpower God. But what, what he also gave humanity uh, upon creation was something that he did not give any other created being. And, and um, so a couple of y'all have said it. Um, what is it that we have that no other creative, uh, anything else God created has? It's a wheel. Uh, because God created humanity for the sole purpose of worshiping him, uh, angels don't have a choice. They have to worship. Birds have to sing. Swim, fish have to swim. You know, everything else has to do exactly what God has created them to do. But man has a choice. And God will never overpower your will. If you do not choose that you want God in your life, God is not going to force you to, to be, not going to force himself on you under no circumstances. Will God, will God say, you know what? You don't want me, but I'm going to make you want me. God's not going to do that. Now, what God will do is al allow chance and circumstance to happen in your life to put you to these breaking points where you will hopefully choose God. Uh, but God will not make you choose him. And so in the text, God has brought Jacob to this point. He has blessed him abundantly and done all this stuff for Jacob. And because Jacob, Jacob is believing that everything that has happened to him, he's been able to do it on his own because of his skill, because he's so smart, because he's so able to you know, make things happen. He, you know, he's a take charge kind of guy, strong man. I want you to also note in this text that Jacob is about 70 years old at this time of this text. So you got a 70-year-old man, got his family now on his way, trying to go back to meet his 70-year-old his twin brother, right, who wants to kill him. And, and, and he, he's at this point where he has emptied out everything. He has, you know, just poured himself out. And at his weakest point, that, I don't want y'all to miss this, because he's afraid, he's stressed out, he's alone. He finally decide, finds a place to get some rest, lays down, still scared, but I got to rest for a moment. Y'all ever been so stressed out you couldn't sleep and you just kept pacing and then finally just laid down and, and sleep finally came? This is where Jacob is. He finally gets some sleep. And the moment he goes to sleep, the text says, a man, God comes and wrestles with him till daybreak. The God who he expects to come and bless him, the God who he's used to, used to speaking, uh, encouraging words to him and lifting him up, doesn't come with any good news, doesn't come with any blessings, doesn't come and say, oh, Jacob, is going to be all right. I'd already take care of it. Go ahead and before Esau. But God comes and fights with this man. And the text says they fight until daylight. But when God finds out that God can't overpower him, that Jacob won't give in. Now, the question would be, uh, why does Jacob not give in to God? And the answer is simply, Jacob doesn't know it's God, right? It's nighttime. It's dark. Jacob lays down. They done told him Esau coming at him. He goes to sleep and somebody grabs him in his sleep. His first impulse is Esau. And he fights to the death. He is fighting for his life. And, 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 and so in, in the sense he's fighting for his life, he's not going to give up. And when God recognizes this fella ain't going to give in, He's going to hold on to what he thinks he knows and what he thinks and who he thinks he is. And so what God does, the text says, is he only touches him. He touches the socket of his hip so that his hip was basically knocked out of place as Jacob wrestled with him. He just touches him. It's at that moment, that touch, that transforms everything. Uh, Jacob's agenda is totally realigned. Because his 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 separation has has put him in a place of this breaking point, and now this isolation, he's all by himself. He has to now figure out how to, you know, what's my next step? What am I going to do different? How am I going to make it through this? And and so he has to totally realign his agenda. But the other thing is that this this wrestling comes because God has to also help him to adjust his attitude. You know, 
at some point, you know, success can make you arrogant. Where, where, where you think that you are beyond anything and anybody, right? I remember hearing a preacher say one time that, that God has to bless him. God has to wake me up in the morning. You know, it was, it was as if he was saying, God ain't got no choice because I'm so good and I'm this and I'm that. God's got to do this for me. Jacob just had gotten to the place that he just believed everything had to go his way. And, and, and the, whole, the whole thing, God blesses him and God has, has increased his resources and all this, not so that he could get beside himself and leave God, but so that he could recognize God and glorify God. That's why God blesses us. But when your blessings become a curse, because you now walk away from God, God now has to get you a point. And so God touches him and breaks his hip. Rec Jacob recognizes that this man who I've been fighting with, you know, struggling with all night long, he just touched me and break my hip. That means he could have killed me. And it is that point. It is at that daybreak when the light comes on. It is, it is that point that he recognized that this is no ordinary man. He recognized that this is God. There are times when God allows things to happen in our life that anybody else, it would have took them out. Anybody else, it, they, they, their life would have been gone. They would have been over. But what it does, it, is just, it just kind of rocks you. It kind of gives you a limp from here on out. And, and you, know, you know that God was there, but God didn't take you out because God's desire is, I can have a plan for you. I need, I need, but I cannot use you where you are outside of me. I need you to come close to me. And, and I'm telling you, my sisters and brothers tonight, that, that because God loves us so much, there is no limit to what God could do would do to draw us to us. John 3, 16, put it like this, because God so loved the world that God gives his son and his son gives his life out of love. God wanted us close to him. And so because God wants us, God will go to the limit. And because God was determined that Jacob is where I'm going to bless generations. God, God comes to Jacob at night. If he had showed up in the daytime, Jacob would have knew who he was because Jacob had seen it before. Jacob had had the Bethel experience. Jacob had had the experience where he said, I'm now two camps. He, had, he knew, but God comes at night when you don't expect it in ways that you didn't know God is coming. When you, do, you think it's the devil, you think it's the enemy, and really God is shaking you and saying, can you hear me? Can you, can I, can you see what I'm trying to do in your life? You know, I need you right here with me. And it is only then that we can begin to really experience God. And so could it be that the breaking points you are experiencing, the, the trials, the struggles, the issues you're experiencing, could it really be the voice of God crying out in the darkness saying, can you hear me now? And, and could it also be that God is trying to get you to align your will with God's will? We, we, we spend so much time um, focused on our dreams, our desires. And the Bible declares that if we delight ourselves, hallelujah, in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. That word delight ourselves in the Lord means that your whole focus, your agenda, everything is centered around God. What do you want out of me? How can you use me? And as God uses you, God also knows your heart and begins to bless you and begins to give you the things that you desire. They, you know, God has given me things that I didn't even pray for. I thought about it, but I was like, I ain't gonna even pray for that. You know, I'm just, you know, everything is good. And God begins to just open doors that I never could begin to imagine. If we can learn to delight in him, Jacob's delight prior to this breaking point was in his possession. It was in his women. It was in his own abilities. But God comes. And teaches him how to delight in God. I'm done, y'all. Any questions or comments? Anybody? All right, I ain't hearing nobody. Um, it it is only it is only in, in, in when the light comes on that we can begin to really see, you know. It is only when the light comes on that we really begin to recognize how God is moving and how God wants to use us or, or, or how God has uh, 
uh, been working in our life. Until until that time, we'll find ourselves really wrestling against, our, against ourselves, and um, and we miss out on so much. Um, I can't wait till next week. <laughs> uh, actually, let me let me just pause. Uh, we won't have class next week because I'll be uh, I got to go to court, and and I'm in court in Virginia in the mountains up in. Um, if anybody know where um, Galax, Virginia is, so. Uh, you know, phone service up there. So, <laughs> um, but we'll be in, uh, we'll be in court next week. So I won't have class next week, but uh, we'll pick up the week after. So what I what I'm asking you all to do uh, in the interim is to um, revisit lesson one and two and really begin to, um, at, you know, begin to discover and see how God is uh, speaking and moving in your life. These these stories um, in the Bible are not just good bedtime stories or given to us just so that we can say, oh, wow, look what God did. But they are given for our example, for our ammunition, for us to begin to discern, okay, when when have I fought against the will of God? You know, what, what areas in my life is God trying to say, I need dominion over this? And, and, and am I saying, no, God, I'm not ready to release it. You know, I, I can't tell you the number of times I hear people to say, I know I need to do this, but I ain't ready for that yet. In other words, the word of God, uh, the spirit of God is speaking to you and telling you that you need to make this step. You need to do this. You need to change this, stop this, drop this, move from this or whatever. And you're saying, I ain't ready for that yet. I like this. I want to hold on to this. And, and because of that, because you, you can't relinquish it, you can't empty out of that, God will push you to a breaking point where you ain't got no choice. And it's at that point, you, you alone, you're by yourself and ain't nobody but you and God. And when there ain't nobody but you and God, ain't nobody you get to argue with but God. You got to deal with God. Amen. All right. Um, y'all quiet. Um, I hear y'all. Amen. Uh, that's all I got for the night. Let, let me just close in prayer. Um, God, we praise and we bless you for every breaking point. We bless you for every situation that has put us at wit's end. And because it's at those moments that we get to see you clearly. We get to hear you and we get to know who we are in you. And so thank you, Lord, for the gift of transformation, the gift of revelation. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this point where we can begin to, to, to move forward in you. For those that are at a breaking point right now, give them the strength to manage it, to survive it, and to thrive from it. We bless you now. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Y'all have a great week. You too. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>